Back on the team top prospects grind here. We are on the Miami Marlins this time, which is one of the most improved, I'd say the most improved farm system since the start of the season. So that's very exciting. Of course, this is the call up. I'm Arm waiting. He's Jack McMullen. We, we were waiting. We were not going to do the Marlins system before the deadline. And man, was that a good decision because yeah. it would have been the biggest waste of time of all time because six of the top 10 prospects in this system for us were acquired either at, at the start of the season or just after the start of the season. And then the majority of them are either drafted or acquired in that top 15. So I'm glad we waited and we got a lot of fun names to talk about that are new faces for Marlins fans in this organization. This was going to be a bleak conversation on like July 10th. And now it's like, oh, I'm really excited for the future of the Miami Marlins and the direction that they're heading. They did as effective of a fire sale as like we've seen in quite some time here. And I don't know who else has done something like this. The Rays were really good at the deadline, but they were really good in a way that like it kind of hurt too. Hey, you know, you're always a contender. Why do you have to move an Isak Paredes? Hey, you're always a contender. Why do you need to move a, a Jason Adam? I understood Eflin because he was escalating, but this was like, hey, every piece that we could possibly sell, let's maximize the return. And it really feel like they did that. And and what I liked the most about it was the positions that they did acquire too, right? Where you, you mentioned just being able to accumulate talent and they did that. And I think the Padres deal is just an example of, let's get as much talent as we can possibly get for a rental and, and Brian Hoeing. Yeah. Whereas you know the Jazz Chisholm deal was, and we'll get to those players, it was, let's get two positions here that we don't have any, really any players at in our, in our system that right. could project for us sooner rather than later. And what's interesting is the Marlins, you know, Peter Bendix, their, their president of baseball operations, made it very clear that, Going into the year, when they, when they knew that they were going to ultimately end up selling around May, June, they were going to target more high upside, lower level prospects, uh, guys that you don't have to add to the 40 as soon, and just try to stockpile as much high upside talent and create those layers of talent uh, the way that you know we've seen Tampa do that. But he pivoted because he took what the market was giving him, and he talked about that, where a lot of the top prospects that were available in deals were actually guys at the upper levels. You're not going to pass on an opportunity to get an Augustine Ramirez. You're not going to pass on an opportunity to get a Davis and De Los Santos for a reliever. So they pivot and they get guys now that I think are going to be closer to big league ready, could be there as soon as next year. And we just talked on the Just Baseball show about the rotation and, and how good that can be, even if you do subtract a Lizardo with the pieces that they have. I think it worked out nicely for Marlins fans who are, are sick of waiting in the respect that a lot of these prospects that they got can actually contribute either next year or at the very least the year after that. Yeah, and I was listening to I, – I texted you this conversation after I, I listened to it, but I was listening to Kyle Seeloff, who's the radio voice of the Marlins, talk with Peter Bendix one-on-one -on -one in Tampa right after the deadline. And he asked a question that I thought was really interesting. It was like, hey, were you trying to identify upper minors prospects or was it just something that happened, like just something that formulated over the course of the deadline? And, and Bendix was pretty honest, and he said it's just something that like – kind of happened and we didn't shy away from it. You know, you could go into this, you know, from a Marlins perspective of saying, hey, we're pretty far off. Why don't we grab a low A all-star team right now and they can all mature in our organization together. But yeah. when you have the chance to go get a guy that has five big league starts under his belt in an Adam Major, along with a Robbie Snelling, who looked like as rapid a riser as we've got in minor league baseball, why do you not do that? They grabbed the home run leader in AAA baseball this year. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, it was a very fun deviation, and this should make things more palatable in 2025 and enjoyable by 2026. Absolutely. And and we'll, we'll jump right into the, the names to watch, which the funny part about that, and of course, is always on YouTube. You can follow along on the screen with us. If you're listening on audio, it's in the episode description where you can click and follow along on the article. They did the lower level, high upside thing with – June sucks shim. So what walk us through the names to watch. I loved this one too, because I mean, you're trading Brian De La Cruz and I know he right. has years of control, but he's not that good. Um, and, and you know, it, it was a fine get for the pirates. I don't, I don't think it was anything crazy on either end, but the Marlins had apparently been trying to get shim away from the pirates for a little bit on different deals. And now they finally do here and he hasn't thrown in a long time. Uh, and, and that's the big question, but the stuff is crazy. 
Marlins felt decent about the medicals. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Shim and then walk through all of the names to watch. Well, and then the the fact that you know you you can move him for Brian De La Cruz when there were a bunch of other guys that were floated. It's like, hey, Shim for blank, and it was always in a Jazz Chisholm type conversation, and then in a Tanner Scott type conversation. And the fact that by the deadline it resulted in Brian De La Cruz instead of those other guys, and you can you know move those guys elsewhere. That was awesome. That was a great shakeout for the Miami Marlins. And Shim, like, listen, has he thrown eight innings in two years? Yes. Um, does he have video game stuff in those eight innings? Yes. He K'd 13. It's a fastball that can get up to 100. He's got two distinct breaking ball shapes. It's gross. Problem is he's thrown eight innings in two years. Um, it's a shoulder thing. So we'll see how he responds in 2025. The 25 is going to be, you know, the, the telling year for Jun Suk Shim. I'm so excited to watch him on the backfield. So that's one of the, the top names I'm going to be searching when I'm walking around there during spring training, just looking looking to see this guy throw. I mean, it's 3,200 RPM on the on the on the curveball, the slider. It's a true sweeper that gets like 18 inches of horizontal. Uh, it's it's stuff that you create in a lab, but of course, got to be healthy, got to be available. And with the litany of pitching prospects that the Pirates have, I think they weren't going to let you know a high risk lower level guy stop them from getting someone that can you know help their lineup in their eyes now and, and moving forward but remember going into this year we were so mesmerized by shim stuff and some of the stuff that we were hearing from you know some folks in the pirates organization we had shim at number seven the preseason uh yeah. in in the pirates top prospect list. so that just shows you how how good he can be no doubt uh next guy is graham Polly, who is part of that tanner scott deal and like, I, I think I wrote in here, yeah. Like, you wouldn't have believed that he would be boarding a flight to Korea to play the Dodgers in February 24. It felt very premature. And this is just another guy that the Padres really screwed over by stunting his progression. Um, so you see that he's in double-A Pensacola right now. And it's like, what happened? He's got big league games under his belt. And he was in triple-A for the entirety of the year. And then, you know, the Marlins grab him and, and send him to Pensacola. That's probably where he should have been to start yeah. this year, double a San Antonio, then you work your way up, but the Padres, you know, totally stunted this guy. And now it's, you know, up to the Marlins to get him back on track. At the end of the day, he can really swing it. He can play all over. This was a very good piece to get back along with a Snelling, along with a major. You know, I, I really like the swing from the left side when we were in the fall league. Um, there, there was just a couple home run swings that were impressive to me, the way he controls his body and, and, and moves in the box. It's a breakout late round pick that because of how impressive the breakout was, they felt like you could maybe help them at the big league level. Uh, but he just didn't really get to develop like a, a normal player. And to your point, like it's good that he's in double A. I think the Marlins really wanted to slow him down and, and just allow him to actually work on things. Not just offensively. They were r running him all over the diamond too, right? He's playing left. He's playing first. He's playing second. He's playing third. Just let this guy play third or, or a little bit of second and develop as a hitter and focus on that. Uh, I, I still think he's a solid bat and a solid prospect. So uh, that was a good get for the Marlins. But, you know, he's going to have to really hit. And with the offense being so down this year, you know, that's yeah. going to hurt his prospect value. But at the same time, like, you can't just forget what he did last year, which was so, so impressive at pretty much every single stop. Exactly. Um, next guy is Gage Miller, who was drafted out of Alabama this year. He was our third round pick. He plays a little bit of second, a little bit of third. He splits his time pretty much evenly. He was one of the better hitters in the SEC. He's already in high A. It's a good thing when your homer total doubles your K rate. Now, granted, like, is that 18 home run tally real? I don't know. He K'd 9% of the time. His first 41 pro plate appearances, he's punched out four times. He's going to put Pat on ball. If he can run into some, that's awesome. But this is a guy that can – you know, be such a high floor bat, it mm -hmm. seems, and play second and third base. Super simple, like super simple operation. And he's just gonna make a lot of contact. I, I'm worried he might put it on the ground too much. We'll see what that all looks like. Put on, he didn't put on the ground too much in college, but it becomes a little bit harder professionally uh, yeah. to, to do that consistently. And, and I think that might be a little bit of an issue, but I know the Marlins are really excited about him and, and they're pushing him quite aggressively to already have him up in high A. I, I do agree, just it's that high floor can move around the infield a little bit, doesn't punch. The question is just how much power is there, and we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. Next guy is Carson Milbrandt, the right-hander in Beloit, 20 years old, spin machine, like everything spins. He's got like fastball good at the top, and then, you know, he's got a good curveball off of that. The problem is 
He's just not throwing strikes right now. Mm -hmm. He walked 50 in 95 innings last year. He's walked 53 in like 83 innings this year. So for some reason, he just cannot find the strike zone, but he's like a super athletic guy that can really spin it. And it's just a matter of honing it in. He also doesn't K as many people as you would expect. Yeah, I, I think that's because of the command. You know, that like you said the fastball is good, but when your secondary strike rate's about 52%, yeah. guys are just not respecting it right now. So it's hard to punch guys out when all you've really got consistently located is the fastball and they're going to spit on, you know, the spin most consistently. I think there's ingredients here for him to be a good arm. He's still just 20 years old. Uh, and and like you said, there's, there's the projection there and the fastball quality is there. So definitely a name to watch, but he's going to need to, you know, make a step in the right direction here command wise. Just can't be walking 14% of batters. Yeah. Next guy, Nathan Martorella, um, who's pretty much splitting his time between first base and the corner outfield uh in double A. Martorella is, you know, I I texted you, I was like, it's tough to like look at those numbers, you know, this year. And it's like, yeah, he's probably just a victim of the level. And he's been in the Southern League for the overwhelming majority of the year. I think he played like what, 15 games with San Antonio, and then he came over and, you know, he's he's been really struggling in Pensacola. But at the end of the day, this guy bucks the trend of first basemen that look like him. You think bunch of swing and miss, tons of power. He's got a well-rounded offensive game, it seems. And, like, if he can survive in the corner outfield, that's an even bigger boost. Yeah, it, it's been tough to watch a couple of these, you know, both him and Marcy coming over. It's just they haven't been – uh overly comfortable i think in the southern league and look, the, the southern league i it's insane we've talked about the numbers they they definitely are playing with the baseballs there like there's definitely weird stuff going on but martarella over his last 20 games 300 380 429 slash line so things are starting to look up there as well uh he hits the ball hard he elevates consistently especially to the pole side so this is still a guy that could have a big league role one way or another um and, and could be a platoon bat but He's still he's just too solid to to fully ignore after a slow year, especially in the league, you know, that that they're in right now and the league that he's dealing with. And the fact that he's been able to see some action at other positions, whether it's been great or or not, um, is, is a testament, I think, to a little bit more versatility maybe than people would thought. Yeah. A couple of arms here. Aiden May, who was just drafted, um, he was bouncing around a little bit. What he went Juco to Arizona to Oregon State. The numbers were good at Oregon State and he was, you know, pretty much an innings eater there. Uh, he wasn't, you know, striking out the world at Oregon State, but he had good command. Um, you know, it's fastball slider for the most part. Like, it's too early to make an assumption about this guy, but, you know, he looked the part at a really good college baseball program. So, you know, you you like that grab at pick number 70 overall last month. Yeah, it's a fun mix where you, you got the four-seamer and averages 94. He's got this split change that if he can command it more consistently, can be gross. He just couldn't command it very consistently. And he he does have a great feel for the slider that he threw more than his fastball. So um, yeah, I think there's there's a, a high floor as as a quality reliever because of that slider quality. Yeah. And, and the fastball velocity would probably tick closer to the upper 90s. But you know, I think with the fastball slider and, and splitter combination here, um, you, you could have a starter's arsenal, and I'm interested to see how he develops. It's kind of a red flag, no? Like throwing a slider more than a fastball in college? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's surprising, but you know, I'm, I'm interested to see like if that was more just because he was so confident in it. Like 67% strike rate on that slider is pretty crazy. So maybe he just felt like he could spot it consistently and didn't need to go to the heater, but I, that's the thing I want to watch when we get to see more of him professionally. Like, how, do you not trust that fastball? Is, right. is the fastball shape not good enough? Yeah. Uh, do you not have enough confidence in it? So that's going to be the thing to monitor. Got it. Uh, Left-hander, Dax Fulton. It's it's just about being healthy. We saw this guy look really sharp and look like a top 10 prospect in the Marlins organization. He's a huge human, 6'7", 235. He uses that size to his advantage. It's all about coming back healthy. Yep. All about it. And such a good guy. He's been on the show. He, so easy to root for. Six six lefty with the stuff that he has. I mean, it's easy to, to get excited about that. Still just 22, so time's on his side. Fastball was, you know, sitting up to, to 94 last time out, you know, when right before the injury. And curveball was an absolute banger from that release point. Changeup was coming along. I mean, we saw at the end of 2022. I mean, that postseason outing where he, he, he pitches against Montgomery, he goes six innings of one hit ball, strikes out 13, no runs. And then it, it started to look like he was pitching through some ailments. 
uh, during the 23 season in double A. And then we saw one last outing where he punches out nine and then that's where he ends up, you know, not throwing again because of the elbow issue. So I'm, I'm eager to see him back. I, I know that he's just started throwing again. So, I mean, whenever he's on the mound, he he's a, he's a prospect of interest because of the natural talent alone. And we've seen flashes of what can be, you know, a guy that was potentially a top 100 candidate if he had, you know, carried the momentum from the end of 2022 into 23. But of course, you know, the, the injury you know held him back from that, unfortunately. Marlins paid this next guy like a top 100 candidate, Luis Cova. Uh, Victor Victor mentioned here. Um, oh. At first, it was Victor Victor Mesa. Then it was Giddy Cape. And now it's Luis Cova in terms of big money IFA signings. The first two whiffs, it's very, very early with Luis Cova. But at the end of the day, he's 35 for 41 in the stolen base department in 52 games. And he's really not punching 10% K rate in the DSL. So uh, that's good. But you know, $1.4 million committed to an international free agent. Like that probably makes your shoulders tense a little bit as a Marlins. Fan. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the Marlins have had a, uh, an interesting track record in that regard. Uh, you just assume that's going to change a bit. They've invested a lot into like academies and, uh, or in, in, into having the, the complex there. And I mean, Kova has looked pretty good. I think they, they probably were expecting a bit more offensively, uh, but you know, he does, bring the speed to the table. I, 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 w- I was expecting him to swing it a little bit better this year, you know, sub 700 OPS, but he's patient. Uh, I think there's hope that he can grow into a little bit more power. They're hoping he can stick in center. I think he might end up moving to a corner, but you know, it's, it's trying to find that a way for that speed to be more useful. And he's not turning 18 until February. Yeah. So plenty of time to work that all out. We got time. Another guy, Jay Bashirs, who is a Duke guy again. Two Duke guys in here, right? And Paulie and Jay Bashirs. Sixth round pick last year. Looked really good in low A to start the year, then struggled mightily when he got to high A. And uh, since he's come over, is yet to hit the ground running uh, in Beloit as well. But as a guy that's splitting his time between short and third, does he have staying power at short or no? I, I, th- I think he can actually potentially stick there like it, it's at least in a, in a pinch and i think the fact that he, he could be passable at short really helps his profile it could be a very good third base as well but i think they're mm-hmm. going to continue to give him reps at short he's just 22 and uh, they feel like he has the ingredients to potentially be able to be an average defender there feels like a bat to ball utility guy yeah and, and and i know that the marlins are excited about him because the evs are a little bit higher um and the fact that the bat to ball is already there um they feel like he, there's a lot more ahead in terms of, of what he's been doing offensively, some bad batted ball luck. They feel like it's going to get better. Uh, I know that this was a guy that they were quite excited to to add. Two more guys here. Uh, Jacob <laughs> Berry, third base slash first base slash outfield slash DH in double A. I've got the numbers here in the write-up. Um, in 239 career minor league games, He's slashing 237, 300, 371. He hit 173 in April. He hit a buck 38 in May with an OPS under 400. And he's like, (laughs) oh, have we gotten to the bottom? The answer apparently was yes. Because since June 1, this guy's slashing 306, 378, 466. The power isn't eating like a top 10 pick that was, you Mm -hmm. know, essentially a DH should eat. But at the end of the day, like, we're looking at the best stretch of Jacob Berry that we've seen in his pro career. Yeah, I mean, you'll take 316 with an 808 OPS over the last 30 games any day of the week compared to what it's been. The bat to ball has been really good. It's just, you know, how, how much power is in there? I don't I don't know. Uh, he's very right. pull happy. The other problem is, like, where is he going to play? I think right field now looks like it makes the most sense. But even then, like, can he move well enough in right field? Like, not really, right? Not really. It's just where would he be the the least bit bad? Like, yeah. first base probably then. Yeah. But I think, you know, for now, they're going to just keep putting him out there, see how he does in, in, in right field. And it seems like that's where he's getting more of the reps. He was very adamant. I think you saw quotes, like, out of the draft. That I'm a third baseman. I'm a third baseman. I think he's accepted that that's probably not the case anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and that has probably helped him more on the offensive side, just not even to worry about fighting for his life at third base because he he really was at, at points there. Um, it, it's it's good to see him picking it up a bit. I still wonder what that looks like at the big league level. But, I mean, we're talking about a guy here that was getting concerning to the point where it's like, is, is he even a prospect uh, right. if he was continuing to struggle the way that he was? I think the way that he swung it in the second half here, 
he's a prospect and, and he's a guy that you got to follow. And if he can find a way to tap into some more power consistently too, um, there'll be a big league role there potentially. But counter, he's not at the top of this other names to watch. Like we do this in alphabetical order. So like, I know he's listed second. That doesn't mean he's the number 17 prospect. In oh, the no. system. Like he's not near the top of, you know, these guys when it comes to excitement level of guys that we've run through at this point. But the last guy is probably at the top of that. And like, it was a very interesting dive. 2023 IFA signing, Kiner Benitez, the left-hander, already in low A, sporting a 2.73 ERA in 56 innings this year. Opponents hitting under 200 against him. He's low to mid-90s with a fastball. He's got like the two shapes on it, a four-seam and a two-seam. But this guy, man, like it, it seems like he's got a feel for the strike zone. And he just turned 18 in late May. The fact that he's already in low A. They're pushing him a bit, and he seems to be kind of taking it in stride. I mean, the, this is where the Marlins do, you know, seem to mine those gems, right? I mean, and you, there's always seems to be some intriguing pitcher that emerges from the lower levels, and uh, great feel for a changeup as well, which kind of fits the bill for the Marlins. But yeah, the fact that he's an 18 year old lefty that's already sitting 92 and a half with the fastball, I think, is is really encouraging. And the fact that, as you said, he's filling it up the way that he is. It's also quite encouraging. And to have a feel for a changeup like that is is great. So I mean, we'll see how he can kind of spin it. The curveball is flashed. He's mixed it in a bit. But to have that fastball command already, to have that changeup feel already for an 18-year-old lefty, like I, I'm excited to see how aggressive they push him. No doubt. Let's get into the top 15 here, where it starts with another recently acquired, not as recent. Of course, he was acquired in the Luis Arias deal, Jacob Marcy. I loved everything I saw from this guy in the Arizona Fall League, but obviously that's a, a very loaded sample there because he won the MVP of that league. Right. Um, it hasn't been the same since he broke out last year, right? He had 16 home runs between high A and a little bit of double A, then does what he does in the Arizona Fall League. Then this year, even started slow in the Texas League and then came over to, to the Marlins in that Arias deal and, and just has not totally picked it up either. He has been a bit better over the last 20 games or so as well. A lot of guys have been a bit better over the last 20 to 30 games in the Southern League, by the way. So uh, just another weird variable that I, 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 I'll i just leave it at that. Like That's also they, essentially the start of the second half. Yeah, maybe they tried a new baseball again. Uh, who knows? But regardless, Marcy, what I like is the floor is just so high here, right? We're talking about a guy that is a menace on the base paths. He's stealing 40 bags every the last two years now. Yeah. In, in 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 these seasons uh he, he can play great defense in center field he is also extremely patient so you have a guy that gets on base plays great defense and steals bases that to me screams fourth outfielder when you can play great defense in center the question is just how much offensive ability is there like yeah. we saw stretches last year he tapped into more power he elevated more consistently and that manifested in you know 16 plus home runs but seems like it, the EVs are just going to be too low for him to consistently do that. The quality of contact, there's just big gaps in there. So if he could even be an average hitter, he's a second division regular, I think, in, in center field. But it seems like fourth outfielder makes the most sense. But a guy that, you know, if you're in a pinch and he has to play every day for a stretch, yeah. I, I think that'd be a great, you know, plug-in guy that's at the bottom of your order and gets on base. So yeah. still has time, though, to, I think, find some more offensively. He gets to first, and then he figures out a way to get to second base after he gets on first base. Now, you've got 55 runner here. Why 55 when this guy has stolen 40 each of the last just based year. on, like, run times. But, like, he's he's an insane, insane base dealer. He just gets ridiculous jumps. But run times to first are, are above average, which is the craziest part. He's just a superb base dealer. Interesting. Okay. So run doesn't necessarily take into account stealing bases. Like it, not really. Um, maybe we can talk. That's a whole conversation we'll have to have in the off season. Cause it's like, it should potentially because like, what else does running matter for other than I guess the, tracking balls down in the outfield. Yeah. And getting to first base, beating hits out, stuff like that. But, um, and just, just being able to run in general, but like it can be misleading because there's sixties that are not nearly the base dealer that he is. So, okay. That's the interesting point, but I, I was four too when I watched him in in the AFL. Like he ran well, but it, he he didn't even look like a plus runner. So it, it's amazing that he he he's able to steal the bags that he does. He, you think he accelerates very quickly, and and I I feel like he gets to his top speed quickly, and then just the jumps are great. Gotcha. 
I think that's the jumps also seem to help him in center too, which yeah, is the interesting sure. part. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do some video uh, stopwatch to see if I can get closer to a plus time from him because I I don't know if there's any other like not obvious plus runners that are grabbing 40 bags like that. Just make sure you're wearing a bucket hat inside yes. and you're watching it with the stopwatch. You've got a bucket hat. Make sure you put the sunscreen on your nose and don't rub it in. <laughs> so it's just like the white streak of sunscreen and you're just here with the stopwatch. Ready I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to do it. But yeah, that's an interesting one to, to monitor. Um, and you know, we could, I would love to talk about that actually. Like do we bake in stolen bases into that aspect of things? But like, here's another example, Connor Norby. Yeah. Run times are pretty much similar, but like, the speed's way more useful for, for Marcy. Norby checks in at 14, and people might be surprised by that. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out the best way to like dive into this without just being overwhelmingly negative because he is raked at every single stop. He is, is still continuing to be productive in AAA. But what does is, what is a big league Connor Norby look like? And, and that's kind of the question that I, I even think the Marlins are, are trying to figure out. I think if they thought he was fully ready, he'd be in the bigs right now. The The conversation was, oh, more reps at third. He hasn't even been playing as much third as you'd think. Um, my concern with Norby is the contact rates are fringy. The exit velocities are fringy. The defense is fringy. He has produced at every stop because he has a knack for for just hitting. He elevates consistently. And I think the, the contact rates weren't as fringy at the lower levels. But he, he just seems to have a feel for backspinning baseballs and 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 just outslugging the EVs. We talked about it. The outslug the EVs types usually have to be very very solid bat to ball, and and you got to be making more consistent contact, and you got to have a better approach. His approach is fine. I think it usually has to be above average or or, or plus in the plate discipline department. So my concern with him is there's no value really defensively. He's iffy at second, but I, it does help now that. Maybe he can be iffy at third and then, you know, fine and left and you can move him around a little bit. But I, I'm worried that the hit tool is fringe and then he's going to have to slug. And I just don't know if there's enough impact there. The exit velocities are, you know, really don't point towards 20 homers at, at the highest level. Are they, are they scrapping the corner outfield thing? I That was one question I probably should ask. I, I, I don't know, um, but I would assume so. He, he hasn't has, played there yet. I think he hasn't what, played there yet games. for them. Like seven at second, four at third, and then nowhere in the corner outfield. And like, I just don't think they really need him to be an outfielder. Like, yeah. it, it is something to have in the back pocket. Like, is is if especially in the role that I think he's going to serve at the big league level, which I think he's a lefty masher. He's got an OPS over nine hundred in the last two seasons against lefties. I think that's a role that he would really thrive in is that lefty masher who can move into different spots. And if you're going to be that short end platoon guy, it really helps your value and your ability to get on the field more if you can play multiple spots. So if you can play second and then a little bit of left, because I think the arm might be too short for third, but we'll see, like that would definitely help. But right now, I think I just see a lefty masher um, and, and that's probably it i just don't know if i see a regular here uh, it's just going to be so hard uh be, it's i just don't know if i've seen a lot of players with you know contact rates that are below average in a 90th percentile it's like 101 uh that's going to be able to hit enough at the big league level but sometimes there's just players that buck trends and and yeah. things that you look at but uh, it'll be hard i think for him to do that the, the other thing that jumped out to me about norby was like all of a sudden the K rates 28% this year, 27 and a half, 28%. But it was like, it was 20% before that. And I, I like don't really understand that. I guess a guy that, you know, maybe extending his zone because he he's getting sick at AAA. Like, I mean, he was on year three of, of AAA experience. So I would understand the impatience, but the patience is kind of what got you to this point where it's like you were ready to attack and you fended off pitches, but you know, maybe he's chasing a little bit. Is the chase race higher or is it just like, hey, you know, he's he's swinging and missing a bit more in the zone and that's resulted in the elevated camera. The, the chase rate jumped from 22 to 23 and then so negligible. And then from 23 to 24, it's kind of negligible, which is interesting. So I, that's why I wonder if he was just, you know, he, he really raked at ECU, was so polished there. That's why I love the swing out of there um, and just, just the two strike approach, everything that he did. I just wonder if he was just much more advanced than a lot of his competition. Uh, and, and this is a big league bat here, clearly, because of the way that he's hitting at the, at the AAA level. Right. But I, I think it's a big league bat and, and more of a platoon role. Uh, but 
again, guys like this, there's always been some that you, you limit them a little bit because that's what you think makes the most sense. And that's what you think they profile as. And they just don't stop hitting. So he could be one of those guys, but I'd feel a lot better if the plate discipline was, was, was stronger. And if the EVs were a little bit stronger as well. Gotcha. 13. I think the breakout guy in this system this year, if not for number 12, maybe who we'll talk about obviously right after Joe Mack has been awesome. Uh, Joe Mack homered again yesterday, by the way. Oh, and we should mention Norby coming over from the Orioles in that Trevor Rogers deal. Yeah. Uh, Joe Mack, first round pick, comp A, 2021. High school, cold weather catcher. You better be signing up for you know some patience here. Uh, you, you know that it's going to take some time. And it has, it has taken some time. But this year, in a league that we continue to talk about is impossible to hit in, he has – really hit 21 home runs in the Southern league or between high a and, and the Southern league, but 19 been, of which coming in the Southern league yeah, like, like, has, has not slowed down there. Yeah. Um, they're swing and miss for sure, but he's managed to strike out right. Well, 24% this year. And he's a great defender. Like cool. that was the thing that really stood out to me. Cause I was like, okay, well how's the defense, you know, how's that going to look? Because ultimately, yeah, the power breakout's nice, but he's not going to hit enough. I think to, to be a regular in any other position plus arm, He's thrown out like 36% of base dealers this year. The receiving is really good, especially at the top of the zone. It could be a bit better at the bottom. Really good at framing strikes at the top. But regardless, very solid framing-wise. The the Marlins feel like the, the last thing that they really want to see from him here is, is just pitch calling and, and just handling his staff. And, okay, he's 21. That's going to come along. But with that power uptick, it's going to be below average hit. But if yeah. he's capable of hitting 20 to 12, 25 home runs with – above average defense behind the dish that could be a starting catcher or at the very least it's a solid backup catcher you're disrespecting joe mack by the way 38 percent caught stealing rate not 36 percent wow like, give, give him a little bit more credit here That's but um no man i mean like all of a sudden the marlins who them in tampa and you know the cubs for a little bit had like the worst catching outlook in major league baseball all of a sudden, the Marlins can look at two guys at AAA and AA and be like, hey, you're our catching solution here, probably next year, at least by the end of next year, where you, you know, both of you have come up and one of you is going to catch four days a week, the other is going to catch three. And, you know, one of them is going to be in the lineup when, you know, they're not catching and a guy that we'll talk about a little bit later. One of them, you know, might be out of the lineup when he's not catching. But this is a great, like, microwave bat to have where oh, yeah. you put him behind the dish. He's going to handle the pitching staff well. He doesn't need to hold anybody's hand in that pitching staff. If anything, like those pitchers are going to kind of guide him when he's young. Um, and he can run into some homers when he's playing, you know, three days a week. I think this is an awesome number two catcher to have at the major league level. Well, thinking about the pairing, you can dream on to your point. Like you got Augustine Ramirez, who we'll talk about, who's bat first. Glove is, is a process, work in progress. And Joe Mack is, you know, the bats come along, but, you know, the glove is really what stands out. It's comfortably above average with that plus arm. Like, But both of them can slug. You, you're going to have those guys potentially combining. They could combine for, you know, if everything works out for like 35, 40 homers if everything was working out, right? You have Joe Mack in a backup role hitting 10 to 15. And then, you know, you're hoping that you can get 20 plus from Augustine Ramirez if it all works out. So that's the exciting part there. And again, I think the defense – from Mac really helps because if they had two offensive driven catchers, you're going to feel some redundancy. And, and of course they're going to defer to the guy that's been much more productive and is a little bit more projectable offensively in exactly. Ramirez. Instead, you got two guys that might actually complement each other quite nicely at the big league level. Yeah. And you could have, you know, some pitchers like a certain starter in that rotation could say, Hey, I like throwing to Joe a little bit more. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, you know what? Every fifth day, Joe Mac catches, like he yeah. catches, say he catches two starters. And then Augustine Ramirez catches the other three, and Augustine can get off his knees and DH. The old DH, yeah. Those. I mean, that's that's the thing. It's like it's like Gary Sanchez type of you know power potential. So like you know you, you, you keep that guy in the lineup, you know when when he's swinging it. Um, the the other thing though, and I think the, what it boils down to that's most exciting is we're talking about Joe Mack in a big league capacity. We weren't doing that last year, right? So I think that that says a lot. Yeah. Another guy that we were definitely not talking about in any capacity last year, Javier Sanoha. Number 12, utility guy. Man, is he fun. Screams fan favorite. He's one of two guys on this list that are, I think scream fan favorite. Sonoha is five foot seven, maybe five six. He has some of the most ridiculous contact rates I've seen. 
in the minor leagues in, in some time. Not just in the zone, where I think it's like 95% in zone. Also out of the zone. He has an 83% out of zone contact rate. That's about 30% above average in the minor leagues. Think about that. Like pitches that are not in the strike zone, he is spoiling them eight out of more than eight out of 10 times when he is swinging. Like that is the easiest plus hit tool you're going to find. The question then becomes okay, well, what other value does he bring to the table? Does he hit the ball hard enough? He actually does hit the ball just hard enough. I look at the threshold, right? If you're going to be this archetype, which is hit over everything, yeah. what's, you, you still have to meet a, a certain threshold exit velocity wise. Sal Freelick is that threshold at, at the big league level at about 83.7 mile per hour average exit velocity. So Noah's at 85. Um, so that would put him, I think, like 10th or 11th lowest in Major League Baseball. That's fantastic. You take that. Like as long as you're just not breaking, you know, you're not pushing a new boundary for lowest, like then you can start to believe in that prospect more. But the other thing that really helps Anoha is he's a good center fielder. Yeah. He's a great second baseman and he's an okay shortstop. So, I mean, the fact that you have this super utility type, I think that this is a guy that kind of, kind of pick up right where John Birdie left off. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, and I think that's a, a high probability big leaguer. He'd be ranked higher if he there was anything more to really dream on. You can't really dream on much more. Yeah. But, you know, he's also ranked 12th because I feel very, very confident he's filling a big league role. And by the way, still not even 22 yet. And what he's done in AAA is crazy. It was aggressive assignment as is. Yeah, I don't really understand the progression. Like, did you get any intel on the progression of him? Because he played 73 games in low A in 22. He essentially repeated the level last year. He got to Beloit for 30 games. And then like, okay, 30 games there, he had a 675 OPS. It's not like he was lighting the world on fire in Beloit. So you would think, oh yeah, you know, you just start the 2024 season in Beloit. No, he goes to Pensacola and was like, not good. Like an OPS under 600. Like I, I didn't really understand that. He wasn't walking. He hit 246. And then he gets the bump to Jacksonville on 93 games. This guy's hitting 305. Like, how does he go from starting last year and pretty much the entirety of last year repeating low A to now killing triple A? In I think they were, from what I understand, I think they were willing to just say, like, hey, if he struggles up there, whatever, like, we need, we need guys that can fill multiple spots right now. Cause before the trades, like, it was barren up there. And, and, you know, I don't think they were looking at him as like a blue, blue chip prospect. I think they're like, think him they as, viewed him as a glorified org guy. I don't know if it was that low but i think they were willing to push him with the archetype that he is and just say like okay if he struggles a little bit it's fine yeah. like it's not going to destroy his development he's going to still put the ball in play and uh he's going to play defense at different spots and we'll just we'll have him there I, I i was i was surprised uh it didn't really make sense and i i i would like i would love to know what they were thinking there but it ended up working out really nicely and 91% overall contact rate is outrageous yeah. And that's doing that in triple a um, maybe part of it was wanting to get him out of, of that league, that Southern league. Uh, but I, I really do think that it was mostly, we need someone that can fill in at these spots at, at the, at the triple a level. And um, you know, we know that he will survive up there. So they had to push him more aggressively. I know it was more aggressively than they wanted to push him. So it just seemed like he was the best candidate to be able to do it. Got you. Number 11, Carter Johnson. Johnson is a project and I think a project that the Marlins are excited about. Um, he's they, they shelled out extra money for him for a reason, right? They save the money on Orlando. They shell out 1.2 million over slot to get Carter Johnson, sign him away from Alabama, probably going to move to third ultimately. Um, but smooth swing from the left side. Talked about that's even early in the draft cycle. I was saying that's a guy that I thought could be a first rounder because uh, how smooth the swing was from the left side and, the, the projection and the Marlins feel really confident in the power projection here. Like they're very excited about getting him in a weight program and their professional weight program and seeing what that outcome is because he's six two, one hundred eighty, already has that smooth swing already has some present strength, but has so much room to grow that they think that he could grow into a lot more power. I think with that swing, there's potential for above average hit. I don't know how much more, like if it's going to be above average power, but I do think that he could definitely grow into average power. If he's above average hit, average or better power, 
at the hot corner where I do think he could play, you know, above average defense there. And it's kind of a wait and see thing. But when you have a guy with a swing like that and then the physical projection, I think that's a really exciting piece to, to have. And, you know, it's bet on your overhaul development. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Like, so I know obviously the complex has wrapped up at this point, um, but he's in low A already and like it's 10 games he's punched out 15 times in 10 games it's been slow out of the gates um you know i'm just i'm just curious like do you think that was the right decision with a guy like this like i know there are some other organizations that you know if they took a high school guy in the first two rounds position player it was hey you're not going to get into game action here you're going to go to instructs you're going to you know spend all off season with us and then you're going to get to low A next year, and we'll see what that looks like. But they threw him into the fire immediately. Was that the right decision? I, I asked myself the same thing, so I went and watched all the at bats so far. Um, mm -hmm. I, he honestly doesn't look overmatched; like he looks okay. Um, and and so I, I think it is a good one. It, like I'm pro let these guys go out there and 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 play. It's yeah. so long that you really handle the mental side of it properly, which is. You should be, and you're, you're talking to these guys when you sign them. You're, you're talking about the goals and things that, that you want them to do, right? It, make it abundantly clear that outcome is not that important. We just yeah. want you to get out there, be challenged. We expect you to struggle. It's okay. Yeah. Go just get a taste of what it's going to be like so you know what you need to work on this offseason. I'm cool. I like challenging the high school guys because, like, you shouldn't be discouraged if you get blown up as a high. You you were just at prom months, like not, right. not even a couple months ago. Like right. it's okay to get unless they were up. weird, then they weren't at prom. Yeah, well, you never know. Oh yeah, there was there were some players that that skipped prom right to to, yeah. to go train. Yeah, forget, who, forget whose story that was. Um, but no, I, I thought he's he's handled himself pretty well. There was just one game where he got blown up and he had to face like couple big league rehabbing arms like looking rodriguez who just got activated for the the cardinals sneaky uh addition back to that bullpen by the way um i i i think i think it's a good challenge for him and then we'll see how kind of that weight program goes for him and how much power can be added so we're gonna get into the top 10 which starts with victor mesa jr another friend of the show but before that a quick break all right victor mesa jr another higher floor prospect here where it's a borderline plus glove in center field, which elevates that floor with above average wheels. And at 23 years old, 22, actually, for the duration of the season, yep. he, he was really good for a lot of the year. He was playing through a back issue for the last month or so, and that really weighed down his stats. I think he was at least close to league average or slightly above that um, prior. And then playing through that injury, you know, I think that ultimately ended the season really weighed those numbers down. Uh, he, he, he sneaks some impact to the pull side. It really is about the glove and center. Uh, he has not really had an incredibly productive season at any stop, but he's continued to climb because he hasn't been bad either. Yeah. The biggest challenge with Victor Mesa Jr. is he has not handled velocity well at all. He's hitting 170 since the start of last season against 93 plus. Mm -hmm. but then pulverizes, um, you know, or at least is consistently getting the barrel to secondary stuff. And he's very adjustable. He in internally rotates like way too much. Like he gets way too, way too counter rotated towards the catcher with this loud barrel tip. And I think that it results in such a long path, both with the bat and his body to get back on plane and get the barrel out there that he's just so tardy on, on velocity. So I, I think if he can fix that, and we've seen him flash some sneaky pop. We've seen a decent feel for the barrel and you know, he can play center field. And he had, it wasn't just like a month stretch full first half of the season. He was an above average hitter at the triple A level as a 22 year old, who's a glove first guy. So I still think that there's intrigue here with a high probability fourth outfielder and still that like second division regular uh, potential outcome if he can hit a little bit more. It just sucks to hear like that clip against 93 plus and it's not 95 plus. 95 plus you can pallet a little bit more, but the league average fastball in Major League Baseball is 94.2. So like that tells you that against a league average fastball or better, so 50% of the league, he's going to really struggle with fastballs. Mm -hmm. which like needs to be corrected at some point. Um, the good news is time is on his side. The bad news is, you know, we're talking about a guy in AAA that you want to help you as soon as possible. So 
the question like now becomes, hey, he goes back to AAA to start next year. What's that correction going to look like? And I'm sure that's mm-hmm. an offseason priority for them. I, I hope so because um, I really think that that counter rotation is pretty pretty obvious. And you know, when think about like he's almost turning himself into a pretzel, right? When you're when you're turning all the way towards the catcher and then your bat's t- tipped all the way over the other way. Think about how much has to unravel just to get the bat where you need it to right. be. Not going to be able to get to velocity, but then it also shows that he has still such a good feel for the barrel that when he does have time to get it out there, like he he's able to hit those breaking balls well and put post above average contact rates against those breaking balls. And and I do really think it's it's purely the velocity side of things because he's a reverse splits guy. Like he has an 890 OPS against lefties this year. And I literally think the only reason why is the average fastball velocity of a left-hander that he's faced is about 91 and a half. The average fastball velocity of a right-hander he's faced is 93 and a half. So I I really just think it comes down to that. So that could unlock something, or it could be a bat speed issue beyond the mechanics that I'm seeing. And then that is just a problem uh, that would restrict him pretty significantly. Gotcha. Number nine, another acquired prospect in that Tanner Scott, Ryan Hoeing deal at a major just watched him throw last night. I thought he looked good until he didn't. And that's kind of <laughs> been the story, you know, I think over the, since he's got up to, to the big leagues and the triple a, another guy that was pushed pretty quickly, you know, I think he should have been in double a longer. Um, but at the same time, he did have a really good stretch at the end of the year last year in double a, and then open the year just lights out in double a aside from one bad start. It's just a weird situation. Cause it's like, do you want him in the PCL? It's not great either. Some I, like I, I don't know what they should have done. They did need him, and I thought it was an actually normal, like normal kind of rushed promotion for the Padres. Like I, I thought it was not that crazy, but he clearly just wasn't quite ready. Yeah. Um, so now he goes back to AAA with the Marlins, and it's been a little bit better. Just hasn't missed barrels the way that you know he was in Double A. It's interesting because the fastball is ninety four to ninety six, but it just gets hit hard. And I know Stuff Plus models hated it in this big league stint. Uh, but then the slider is plus, and he commands the heck out of it. The curveball is an average third pitch. And the changeup's a big one here, too, because he, he needs to, I think, have a fourth pitch here. He's got to be a guy that, that comes at you with four different pitches to, mm-hmm. to be successful, I think, at the big league level. But the thing that's interesting about the fastball is there's stretches where it looks good, and it's riding more at the top, and he's getting swings and misses. And, again, it's 94, 96. But then there's other instances where it's running to his arm side more, it's flattening out, and when he tugs it down towards the middle, it gets bludgeoned. So finding that fastball consistency, I think, is the difference maker for him here and what would either be a five starter or maybe even a fringe four or a swingman relief type. Which is is funny that it's fastball command that falls back when the overall command is like really good. Like really he commands good. the slider. He puts the slider wherever he wants it. Yeah. I, I, I That's why I think it's almost not even about the command. I guess it goes hand in hand, but it's almost like – the, the way it's coming out of his hand. So I know that that ties in with command, but it's like the fastball action is inconsistent. Yeah. Like, well, and, and it's tough to find a guy that is overwhelmingly consistent. That's long like him. Like he throws like a long guy, throws yeah. like a lank machine. And, and he is a lanky guy. He's listed at 6'2", 180. He throws like he's 6'4", 170. Mm-hmm. Um, there's whippiness to that. And I'm sure that can create inconsistency, especially with the fastball. Cause like, the slider, you can feel the snap off pretty similar, you know, and like it, you can you can feel that in the heat of the moment where it's like, OK, I'm going to snap this. I'm going to start it here. And I'm going to rip it that way with a fastball. Like it really just kind of takes off from where you end up. So yeah. I don't know. I, like A centimeter makes a difference there. Um, you've got six, three, one eighty. That feels better than six, two, one eighty. Yeah. Listed on baseball reference. So no, I think um, six, three. yeah, like it just. I could see how there is inconsistency and how it comes out of his hand. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned the the like kind of whippiness. It's kind of a long arm action, and and he's been a bit more uh, vertical this year, which is interesting because you think that that might actually make it easier to stay behind it. But I think he just naturally cuts the ball a little bit. So being a bit more low three, like uh, he's high three quarter. It's it's really over the top, but being a bit more towards the high three quarters, I think as a natural cutter. Like, because he just naturally cuts it a little bit, actually allows him to to keep it kind of straight and ride. I saw him throw fastballs that were getting like 15 vert and zero horizontal last year. I haven't seen any of that this year. It's more just either traditional or he's getting 15 and 12. And those that get like 15 and 12 are just running right over the middle. 
Um, and that's the problem. So just needing to find that consistency of killing the horizontal. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's the challenge for him. Uh, but when he's doing it though, like he's blowing fastballs by guys and like, there'll be individual pitches that look above average. And then there's others that just look like they're, they're, they're heat seeking missiles to the barrel. So if he finds that consistency, I think he's a solid back end of the rotation arm. And how much has your perspective changed on him? I guess, since, you know, the struggles at, at the upper levels and everything, like where do you think he settles? It just sucked to see him be that unconfident in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. Like it sucked to watch him walk 21 guys in 33 innings. Yeah. Cause that's not, that's, not, who he is. that's not what we're asking him to do. And like, I, I watch a Zebby Matthews and I know he's the extreme example, but I watch Zebby go up. I know the nerves of his big league debut were there, but you know, he pounds the strikes on like, that's all we're asking. Okay. Yeah. The Padres needed innings from Major. They didn't need him to nibble and, you know, leave in the third inning. But, like, that's what was happening sometimes. Yeah. So that made me a little disappointed. Having said that, again, I don't envy anybody that comes up for the San Diego Padres because they get five chances and then they're out. Like, yeah. Graham Pauly, I feel so bad for. CJ <laughs> Abrams, when he came up, I felt so bad for. Ryan Weathers, so bad. Patino, I felt so bad for. To Capita Marcano, I know that's a funny name now in Major League Baseball, but like that guy was thrusted from low A to the big leagues. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, they they, um, and they really they really gambled on him. They they just do shit like that all the time, and I think Major was a victim of that. And I'm excited to see him in a much lower stress environment. I'm excited to watch his second big league stint because that'll yeah. win back, I think, a lot of Major's appeal for me. And a lot lower pressure, right, for the Marlins. I hope they bring yeah, him yeah, at the end of this year yeah. and, and and give him some innings. Um, I think that would be great. Guy that we won't see by the end of this year, unfortunately, uh, PJ Morlando. Number one pick for the Marlins this year, 18th overall, under slop. It gets $3.4 million. And it, it's funny because, you know, I think – People were like, whoa, where did that, that pick come from? I was one of them as well. Uh, you, you also felt the same way with the Brewers with pain. Uh, but when you see the bonuses that these guys get, like it, it's not second round money here, right? Or like, like late second round money. There's teams that were on the trail that probably wanted to shell out $3 million or, or a little bit less to, to maybe sign him late in the first or early in the second or whatever it may be to sign him away from his college commitment to South Carolina. Because I think he really elevated himself in the combine, which is interesting, and just the power display that he can put on there, and some subtle but important swing adjustments that he made down the stretch that I think had people a lot more excited about what he could do offensively, and then a little bit more athleticism, I think, than, than he was getting credit for. I, I have to see more. Like, that's just more of, of what has been said. He's turning it above average runtime, so the Marlins – are going to give him every single shot in center field. Uh, but I I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, they're going to give him every shot out there. I think the plan is most likely that he moves to a corner and he can be that, that like a fine corner outfielder. I I do believe in the power potential. By the way, he, he's out for the rest of the year with a lumbar stress reaction. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do think that there's big power here. And if you look at the swing, like it is a very, very fun – aesthetically pleasing swing when he's connecting. If you go watch that home run derby that he did in, in Seattle or the high school home run derby that he won, like he, yeah. he's no stride. He's wide, super, super mobile and, and, and malleable. Like it's amazing how the body control that he has doesn't even pick his foot up and gets into his back hip and then just lets it eat. And, and, you know, in, in his one at bat before the, the back issue hit a laser beam, 105 mile per hour foul, like 300 feet. So like we saw right away, the bats, bat speed in the whip there. There's just, there's a lot of pressure on the bat because it's probably not going to give you a ton of value defensively. And, you know, I think there was some questions about the hit tool because there were some stretches where he'll take the moves in the box. He was a little too stagnant. So sometimes he'd get on his front foot, swing over stuff. Seemed like he found it a bit down the stretch and was performing well enough to, to get teams, especially the Marlins excited about him. So we'll see how it all looks, but there's a lot of pressure on him to slug. Like you said, combine thing is fascinating because there were two guys that it seems like really boosted their stock at the combine. And it was Morlando and then it was Blake Burke out of Tennessee that went mm -hmm. to the Brewers in the second round. So, like, I'm curious to see if that's a trend moving forward. I didn't hear about that last year when they also had a draft combine. Um, but I, I'm curious to see, like, hey, Morlando hits the ground running next year. Blake Burke hits the ground running next year. It could be, you know, hey, like, 
the combine actually, you know, can help with this, but it's also batting practice. Essentially. I know there are some games where that helps, but like Blake Burke was first team all batting practice at the combine. And that that's really what, what stole headlines. Exactly. And, and you know, more window can take BP man. Like he won right. the, the home run derby. So right. my concern is, is guys that are that stagnant, you know, and there's people that are just, just freaks and, and are so flexible that they can do it. And I, he clearly is very flexible in the, in the box, but it's very hard to be adjustable to secondary stuff when you don't have rhythm and movement. You don't want too much movement, but you got to have some rhythm and movement. He doesn't really have much at all, but it seems like some of the adjustments he made to, to add some of that with a little bit more of a coil, it, he picks his heel up. It seems to give him a, enough, but I am concerned about how he's going to be able to stay back on secondary stuff like that. So we'll see how that progresses. That's just going to be something that you just got to see ABs and we'll be able to see that. He'll be ready to go early next year and go from there. But you can definitely see the skill set offensively for at least average hit and, and at least above average power. So that's what they'll, they'll need to see from him. And you know, we'll, we'll have to just wait. Number seven, Davison De Los Santos came over in the AJ Puck deal along with Andrew Pintar, who should also be a, a name to watch, I think is, is right there as well. I know a yeah. guy that, um, you know, flashes some some intriguing tools. But so Santos has been the most productive hitter in minor league baseball this year. Point blank period. Like, I don't think anybody's been more productive. He has continued to, to swing it pretty well since he came over to the Marlins. Clearly, you leave Reno and you go to Jacksonville. It's not going to be as hitter friendly. But so Santos has continued to, to, to show the power. And he's hit a couple tape measure shots. The question is just, what does it look like for him at the big league level? And I don't even think the Marlins know the answer to this at this point, but I think the Marlins are just excited to have a guy that's 21 years old who's going to potentially hit 40 home runs uh, in, in, in AAA, mostly AAA and AA, and somehow is mitigating the strikeout rate to the degree that it's only 24%. Yeah. The, 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 the thing with him is the chase, and it's been made abundantly clear, like, you got to swing less, that's what we want you to do, and they're going to see if he can do that. He actually looks like a fine defensive first baseman. I don't think third base is, is in the cards, you know, at the, at the big league level, though he still sees some action there. It's going to be a first baseman. He actually looks fine there. The power's 70 raw. I think mean, he puts it on the ground too much to, for it to be, you know, 70 game, even that you dream on. I think ultimately the big league level, it'll probably be 30 home runs. It's just first base, well below average approach, like 40% chase rate and contact rates that are kind of below average as well yet he's still somehow able to mitigate the strikeouts. Can he mitigate the strikeouts the same way at the big league level? I, I don't know. Well, I think we know the answer, you know, totally leans towards no, because again, major league pitching is just a totally different beast. Like there's never been that greater difference. I also love that his headshot is the Cleveland guardians hat when like, <laughs> I mean, it, he was there for spring training and now he's been with Arizona and Miami for a regular season. But um, no, I mean, like five homers in his first 16 games in a Marlins organization in the Marlins organization is outstanding. You're right. He's been the best hitter in, in minor league baseball this year. He's four RBIs away from 100 and huh. he's played 103 games. So we're talking about, you know, a guy that could hit 40 minor league homers this year, drive in 120 this year and hit over 300. It's awesome at the minor league level. Let's let's see what happens at the major league level. Do you think he's a September call up? Uh, I I do because he's already yeah. on the on the forty right. So like I I think so I, and and he should be because that'll be another instance I think where if he's super aggressive again it'll be a nice reminder of like hey you definitely can't do it up here right you're gonna definitely need to find a way to to cut down the chase right. seventeen batted balls over one hundred and ten miles an hour this year. Uh, in his age 20 season is crazy. And the thing that I like about him though, is like, you can be patient. He could come up, he could struggle. You send him back to triple a and he can continue to work on things. He's going to be 21 until June of next year. So I, th that part of it is, 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 you know, I think encouraging overall. Um, I, I just, the reason why he's not higher despite the production is we're talking about 45% chase rate on sliders. <laughs> like that's not, that will get exposed. At, at the big league level like that has to change and then being a first baseman there's a lot of pressure there the other thing too is uh, he, he kind of struggles to elevate fastballs as much as he should and he just kind of struggles to elevate as much as he should period it, he, he hits as many home runs as he does because when he hits it in the air i mean it's sustainably one of the more ridiculous home run to fly ball rates because of how hard he hits the baseball but 
when you get to the big league level, it's not only harder to make contact, it's harder to make quality contact. It's harder to get the ball in the air. So when teams know that you put it on the ground more and that you really are dangerous when it's in the air, they're going to try to make you beyond whiff, make you put it on the ground more too. So it, there's some things he definitely needs to clean up before he has success at the big league level. But I think it would be good for him to get a big league taste so that he knows kind of what he needs to work on. I think some adversity would probably be good uh, as he gets ready for, you know, potentially trying to win a job outright in the opening day next, next year. Yeah. We're going to get to number six here, Robbie Snelling. And we've talked about Snelling a lot, so we don't have to spend as much time on him, but Snelling was a, a fantastic get, of course, for Tanner Scott, you know, and, and, and Brian Hoeing. And it's been a down year and that it kind of allowed them to be able to go get him. Uh, I don't know if he would have been attainable if he was having a better year, but you never know with the Padres. Snelling was our minor league pitcher of the year last year. I mean, he had a one eight two, across a one eight two ERA across one hundred and three and two thirds innings between three levels, finishing in Double A. Yeah. Then this year, fastball has been down a tick. The release has been slightly different, and I think that impacted his ability to locate as consistently. I don't know why his release got a little bit lower than it was last year, but it, but it was um, instead of being average release height with above average carry, it's below average release height with like average carry. So I don't, I don't really know what happened there. And I think that impacted the quality of his fastball and may have even been part of what impacted the the velocity too. I also just think throwing 103 and two thirds innings plus a postseason start didn't help out of high school as a multi-sport athlete. I think they pushed him very hard in, in San Diego. Um, there's been some positive developments here, even in a bad year for him. The changeup, which he told us when he came on the show has come along big time. He's throwing it for a strike like 13% more frequently. He has a 69% strike rate on that changeup, and opponents are hitting 215 against it this year. So that pitch coming along is huge, especially with the inconsistency of the fastball. It's been a weird year. The, the That slurvy breaking ball hasn't been there the way it was last year, but it, it has been more of late. I think we're already kind of seeing him work his way back to looking like Robbie Snelling again. And, you know, over his last three starts, even if you want to extend past yeah. the two for Pensacola, 13 innings, a 138 ERA, 18Ks, four walks. So, uh, I mean, that, that looks pretty good. Well, you're factoring in a start with what, like four Ks, three walks, and three innings? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the last two, yeah, right. 10 innings, 14Ks, one walk, uh, one earned run. Yeah. I mean, dude, like it just feels like he took a deep breath. Does it not? Yeah. I Apparently the Marlins, when, when, when he came over, just, they said, all we want you to do is just throw strikes. <laughs> so and, there we go. And and this works. And like, I, I don't know. There's again, there's just something about it. And like every guy we talk about just turns me more and more off of the San Diego Padres, because for some reason that place feels like such a freaking pressure cooker for mm -hmm. no reason. Why? Like, why push this guy that had a one eight last year and climbed to double a what, like, what more do you want to ask from him? The 2024 should just be like, Hey man, try and replicate what you did last year. It shouldn't be, well, you need to do this, this, and this. No, like you were, you were borderline perfect as, yeah. as a pitching product last year. So yeah. let's like try and find that again. And it, it, again, just feels like he took a deep breath and was like, okay, you know, new scenery, let's do this. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Like the, the release height being so different, um, I really think affected him. And then, you know, just, just not having, the same action on the breaking ball, which was so effective for him as well, probably because of the release differences. Now he's throwing it harder again. I think he's cutting loose a little bit more. And what's wild is he's thrown 52 secondaries since coming over to the Marlins organization. 45 of them have been strikes. Wow. So like his feel for it's back. And I think, you know, maybe even just being in a, in a more pitcher friendly environment, he's trusting his stuff now more a little bit. The fastball, is got to be a little bit better and the velocity has been down um, like that tick, like we said, but the characteristics, like we've seen it better in the past. Maybe he can get that right and, and kind of get back to where he was last year, but there also could be another tick or two that he can gain. I know he's been down a bit this year, but I think that he can gain because he's such a good athlete, but even if he's operating in the low nineties with a, 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 an above average change up a curveball slash like swerve that is at least average flashes above average as well. That three pitch mix with his command and athleticism and just pitch ability that we've seen in the past, like that should make him a high probability back into the rotation starter. No doubt. But, you know, I, I still think there's room for more. And I'm very, very interested to see how he comes back off his second like professional offseason. So I usually yeah. think that's one where guys make the most adjustments. And for sure. 
and I'm interested to see what that could look like. Because at that point, you've at least run into some adversity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're going to get to number five, which starts with Jared Serna. But before that, one more quick break. How about Jared Serna, man? I don't know if there's been a prospect or I, – I can't think of very many other prospects that have elevated themselves more – than Serna has this year. And he did that in the Yankees organization too. I mean, he he elevated himself with them internally to the point that you know, he played more games at second base la- last year than shortstop. Yeah. We were joking about him in the in, in the offseason that this guy loves baseball more than anybody because he went to the winter league and played like every game there too. I think he played like 200 games last year. 122 last year in the minor leagues and then 61 in the Mexican winter league. That's insane. <laughs> So many baseball games. Yeah. And he worked his butt off to add some strength and improve his glove at shortstop because he wanted to, to, to prove that he could play there. The glove has come along to where I think he looks like an average defender there. Some things that he needs to work on in terms of you know, making throws from different angles more consistently and um, just sometimes like the, the posture and, and actions at the position. But he's got an above average arm. His, his, his glove work looks good. He's reading hops quite well. Uh, he's comfortable ranging to his left and his right. Uh, he, he's just really come along. He gets the ball out really quick. He looks like a shortstop to me. And I, I know that the Marlins are looking at him as, as a shortstop and potentially there, he might be their best shortstop prospect now moving forward. Also, how about the, the, the impact that he's added? There's a guy that was always hit over power. And is he going to hit 20 home runs now? Probably not, but I feel really good about his ability to hit consistently. Remember this is a se- five foot seven guy as well. I don't know if I've seen a player with a max exit velocity below 110 miles per hour. I think his max is 109. Have an average exit velocity of 91 miles per hour. Hmm. That's what he's got, which is crazy. That tells you he's getting his A swing off like all the freaking time. And he's barreling baseballs as much as anybody. He has a 41% hard hit rate for a guy that's five foot seven. Like that's absurd. So he's getting his A swing off consistently and finding the barrel consistently. And yeah. we're talking about how hard it is to hit in the Southern League. Since he's joined the Southern League, this guy's been putting up video game numbers. Yeah. I mean, it's, what, 14 games? He's got 10 doubles in 14 games. Um, slashing 397, 455, 569 in 12 games with Pensacola. We talked about the setup, too, a lot over text. I feel like... You know, he kind of capitalizes on pitchers' stubbornness. There are a lot of professional pitchers that say, I want to beat you inside. I want to beat you inside. Yeah. He doesn't he doesn't let anybody beat him inside. You're you're not beating him inside. <laughs> He's he starts, very far off the plate. You might beat him outside, but you're not beating him inside. He starts super far off the plate and he is open. And then he gets and this is like he got even more into this. And I think this has had, helped him add even more power where he he like coils so dramatically in and and as he brings that leg over and really engages that lower half and then just lets it rip. On pitches on the inner half this year, he's slashing 306, 378, 569. Wow. Um, and that's allowed him to tap into like average power to the pulse. He has 13 home runs. No, seen this guy have multi-homer games. Um, do, you, do you have the outer half numbers in front of you? I, I do. So on the outer half, he is – 231, 319, 331, which is not really a disaster if you're demolishing on the inner half and he doesn't chase. So, like, if you can just continuously spoil pitches on the outer half, spoil or shoot them the other way, it'd be a problem more if he re- rolled over too consistently there. Yeah. Obviously, like, the, the scouting report's going to be attack him away, but what what are you going to do when he spoils them and spoils them and spoils yeah, them? Easier spoils said them. than done. Yeah. You know, so. I think from that perspective, it's it's interesting. It's actually 674 OPS. I went one inch too far the other way. Um, I, I think that part makes it makes it fun though because he's leveraging his strength really well, and like we've seen guys be able to do that. Like you don't think teams want to pitch Isak Paredes away? <laughs> uh, like it, it just if you're able to spoil and Paredes does too, like you you can survive. And with Serena, he has a good feel to get to pitches outside of the zone. Um, he, above average in the out of zone contact rates. He's he got such a good feel for the barrel that you're going to probably execute well to get him out. And he's probably going to be able to spoil that. And then eventually you got to come into him and he's going to hit it hard. The thing is he hits line drives like crazy. He barrels it like crazy. He still shows the ability to go the other way. 
And I, I think he's going to be a doubles machine. He has 36 this year. But I think even at the big league level, when you have a 91 mile per hour average exit velocity, which again is like unheard of for a player that just does not have that much power, like to be getting into that that consistently, I, I really do feel like this guy's going to be a doubles machine. He could still probably add 10 to 15 home runs. Cool. And the fact that he can play short too is 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 huge. Massive. I think he's the starting shortstop for the Marlins by the middle of next season. Really? Mm -hmm. So where does noted cycler Xavier Edwards go? Second, I think he's. He's, he's improved, and it's been nice to see him survive at short. I, I, I think he's a second baseman. And Norby goes we'll see. somewhere else. <laughs> Tune, move around, do a little of everything. Got it. Dylan Head checks in at number four. We've talked about him plenty, too. Acquired in that Luis Rice deal, also out for season uh, with a hip surgery to repair. I think he had an adductor issue. They, they took care of it. I think they're Confident he'll have a full recovery and be ready to go at the start of next year. This guy's a plus defender in center field, and it is so fun to just watch him glide out there. It's a plus plus runner. I, we saw flashes of of some exciting offensive upside where he'd even flash average or slightly more juice to the pull side. Uh, but you know, I think this year was kind of lost for him because of the hip issue. Just didn't seem like he could ever really get into his base. Or some tinkering with different loads, different setups, blah blah blah. Like yeah. this is a guy that has above average bat to ball skills at least has the potential for it, at, at least fringy power. But I do think there could be more than that. And then you have elite wheels and a, and a plus glove in center field. He's got all the ingredients to be that table setting, uh, you know, center fielder. Got you. Yeah. I mean, he's a speed demon. Like, you know, that's why I love him. Um, he was striking out a little bit more than I was expecting in like a very, very limited sample. But like, I just feel like there's nothing to take away <laughs> from him, unfortunately, this year. So I'm excited for 2025 and and see what this guy can do. He's a freak athlete, and, and freak. He's, made that, he's made that abundantly clear. And and I, I do think that that glove, I haven't seen enough to be able to put that like 70 future, but I, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if it's a 70 future. I just couldn't do it yet because like we he's said, only we played 53 games. games. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and but I really liked what I saw in the San Diego stint last year, and yeah, um, you know, I, I, I'm 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 expecting him to to kind of be the guy to watch in the system next year, and I think these scouting grades can adjust. I think you got to take these with a grain of salt. Yeah, it just sucks because like there's such a small sample to work with here, and we're so far removed from the sample, and and a good part of the sample he was hurt. So yeah, <laughs> exactly, it's just brutal. Yeah. Number three, Noble Meyer. We talked about him in recent episodes as well because of the the struggles of late. Um, just missed. He, he just missed the top 100. That's where we talked about him. Uh, he He's still Noble Meyer, man. And we that's what we talked about, right? Like where he's still extremely talented. He's 19 years old. Um, some some other interesting context was he actually put on 20 pounds of just, just good weight. And um, well, it seems like there might be some challenges of just controlling that weight because he's a 19-year-old who just now got heavier and you're trying to control that all on the mound and, and it, the mechanics kind of going awry. Um it hasn't had that same fastball that was getting way more horizontal run last year. Now it's been more dead zone because he hasn't been able to repeat that release point as much. The slider still looks elite. The change, it looks like it's actually come along quite cool. nicely. And it looks like it could be an above average pitch. But the problem is velocity has fluctuated too much. Uh, it seems like sometimes he's trying to guide it in there. It's yeah. not like so it's not an injury thing or anything like that. He hasn't been feeling any discomfort. Just, I think he's been frustrated with the inconsistency with his delivery. And as a result, trying to fill up the zone a little bit more by taking some off of it. And that hasn't helped either. And that's ended up affecting the movement on his fastball. So I think what what you know they want Noble to do is just kind of get back to being Noble, be free, throw, who cares? Just go out there and and let your natural ability shine through. Um, and I think right now what we've been seeing from Noble Meyer is him being a little bit too mechanical. Um, and, and when you're a six five athlete like he is, yeah. with just the natural life on your stuff, you gotta let it be natural and you gotta let it live. No doubt. I've also never seen you do this where you have a 10 point difference in two categories. You grade four things here. You have a 10 point difference in president future in two, and then a 15 point difference in two others. So like you, what, what this tells me is you see as stark of a difference between August 16th, 2024 noble Meyer and the finished product of noble Meyer is anybody that you've really put a grade on that's top 100. That's any team top 30 list or top 15 list. Yeah, I I mean got to see him in person and I think he moves really well too. Like it just it seems like it's it's more of it doesn't seem almost as much of a mechanical issue. It's just like like he, he moves well up into the point of release. It seems like syncing up the arm action uh more consistently. It's a long arm action, and then now uh, 
the, the conversation had always been about him. And, and when I was watching him work with coaches and everything on the backfields, it was kind of uh, the way that he was just so involved with the coaches. You can tell he's very thoughtful with the Marlins yeah. ultimate because he's a smart, smart kid, almost too smart for his own good at yeah. some points here where I think he's, he's just getting away from the pitcher that he's always been. So I think as he gets back to being natural, has an off season to work um, and, and maybe clean some things up delivery wise, that fastball we saw, I've already seen it flash plus. So that's why I could comfortably put that, you know, 10, 50 to 60. And then the, the change up, I mean, the, the action on it's ridiculous that he's now found. I, he just can't command it right now. So that's why I can comfortably say it's, can be above average, but right now it's not. The only one I'm a little bit nervous on is the command because the command may never get to average. If he never figures that out, then you know there's reliever risk here. But I still think you, you got a really special arm that's just going to take a little bit more time to to develop than uh, the top arm in this in this uh, system. Yeah, just put him in the incubator for a little bit. Yeah, he's 19 years old. Right. Augustine Ramirez, who I think is the future of the catching position for the Marlins as soon as really next year, um, acquired in that Jazz Chisholm deal. This dude hits the ball very hard. We've seen him hit flash exit velocities as high as 116 miles per hour. The problem is he doesn't elevate as consistently as you'd like to see either. That swing can kind of get downhill. Uh, But the question seems to be about the defense. The more I I dig, the more I watch, yes, he's not ready to handle a big league staff consistently right now. I think it's come along. I think the receiving has come along. The catch and throw needs to be better. The arm is good. It's just it, there's just some fundamental things that still need to come along for him. But I think he's progressed pretty nicely overall, and I still think that this is a guy that can be a good enough catcher uh, to 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 get by. And and I think that's the important aspect of this as well. It's like he doesn't need to be elite. He just needs to be good enough. And uh, yeah. he's been better. You know, I think with with the Marlins, that the Marlins feel like their best you know catching coaches and and everything are are there in AAA, and they've been encouraged with what he's been able to do. Sent even with the Yankees, I heard you know that he earned super high art marks for his makeup, work ethic. This is a guy that knows that he's going to have the catching position potentially available for him next year. Has a good work ethic. Has continued to progress as a catcher. Is still just 22 years old. Has a whole off season to grind on that, and he's going to be a focal point of the Marlins as well to get that defense right. I think that considering that he has an above average arm, has the strong hands behind the dish to be a better receiver as he gets yeah. more natural. I think he can at least be a fringy defender. And if he's that guy's a 90th percentile exit velocity of 108 miles an hour, he posts average, uh, average contact rates. He doesn't chase that much. He's 22 homers as a 22 year old between double and triple a, like this guy mashes. So he doesn't need to be much better than that. It's like that Gary Sanchez comp and like the good Gary, like yeah. that, that that's a good catcher. And, and I still think he can be better blocking. And remember a big part of Gary was he was lazy. Augustine's not lazy. So he's going to make up for maybe some of those shortcomings with the way that he works behind the dish. I know his pitchers love the way that he he grinds back there. By good Gary, you mean Padres Gary. Yeah, or like the stint with the Yankees. Yeah, Babe Ruth Gary. Like, oh, he was tracking on pace with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Mickey Mantle. Oh, nice. Um, no, I mean, dude, like he is – I'm as excited to watch his situation unfold in spring training next year as I am most situations to, to yeah. watch unfold. Like – Next spring training is going to be huge for Augustine Ramirez. And there are a couple of guys like that. You know, there are some there are some starting pitching prospects that, you know, I'm excited to watch really blossom in spring training next year. Like Jackson Job is at the top of that list. I'm very excited to watch Jackson Job throw next spring. But Augustine Ramirez, in terms of just like handling his business offensively and how he looks defensively, that's that's a huge tell how he performs in that spring. He's going to be there for the entirety of big league camp, I would think. Um, yep. And I mean, he should he should probably break camp with them. Cause again, like that catching situation has been so bleak for the last, however many years. And all of a sudden it's not bleak anymore, which is really cool. And I mean, what I like to is for whatever reason, it doesn't happen defensively, which I, again, I'm pretty confident it will. And he's already close enough. There's so much power. He's still going to be a big league. And and there are so many defensive minded catchers that you can find to compliment him in a catching tandem, even if it isn't a Joe Mack, like you can go sign that defensive minded catcher to a one year deal because those guys are getting DFA would all the time. Absolutely. From an offensive perspective, this guy destroys fastballs, four seamers, 391, 476, 816 slash line. Jesus. You know why? Because he elevates them consistently. The problem is he can't consistently elevate secondary stuff right now. And I shouldn't say can't. He's just not doing it as consistently as he should. Yeah. But if he can find that, 
that just shows you what the potential could be here, right? Like this guy on fastballs, you know, is home runs per ball in play. 13% of the four seam fastballs he puts in play leave the yard. Jeez. <laughs> That's an absurd stat. Yeah. So it, that also elevates the offensive floor because you're going to see a lot of four seam fastballs still. But he's not a disaster against breaking balls. It's not like he's, he's whiffing. It's just that the path, because it's downhill, results in more ground balls, whereas – when it's a little bit downhill, but it's still flat enough with four seamers where he's still going to create that backspin. So if he can just find a little bit more loft in his swing path, it really could be that 60 power and he could be hitting 30. So then you'd care even less about the fact that the glove is like fringy, which okay. I, I still think can be, it can be close to average. Yeah. That can be fixed in December, January. Absolutely. I'm getting a spinny wheel before we get to Thomas white. Here we go. Number one, Thomas white. This guy's the clear cut number one prospect in the system. I, I, I don't think I, I don't think you can go any other way at this point. I'm curious what you think there. Cause like, I know you feel the same way that he's number one, but I'm curious, like we didn't talk about like how number one he is like it from what you've seen from this 19 year old, you can, you can tell me you disagree. Like, I got I'm loading this question. So I don't want to load it too, too much. Yeah. Is he, are you as high on him as being the clear cut number one guy in the system as I am? Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. Cause like everybody else you can poke a hole in. Like everybody else. And Thomas White, he has not allowed you the opportunity to poke a hole in him to this point. Like, what's the hole that you're poking right now? 40 command? At the end of the day, he's not walking, guys. Like, it's yeah. it's really for, like for, around For a 6'5", 19-year-old lefty, it's 9.5% yeah, like, walk rate's fine. You know, he's not Noah Schultz, but, like, I'm, I'm fine with yeah, him not okay. being Noah Schultz as long as he's not, like – I don't know, random sprayer here that that just cannot find it at all. Like a Mick Abel, right? I look at Mick Abel on the other side of the spectrum, and then I look at, you know, guys that are, are constantly around the strike zone. He is like more of a command-oriented guy than not, and way more of a command-oriented guy than his stuff should make you. That fastball changeup combination is utterly disgusting. And the fact that he can even turn his hand over the other way is impressive. The fact that it's borderline good is all you need to see. So like, I, I man, be even better than good too. Like yeah. I think it could be, it, it could be another, as he develops it, that could turn into another plus pitch. Cause remember, I think he's going to gain some more VLO too. So if, like I'm dude, I'm just obsessed with young guys that can turn their hand both ways and not spray it. That, and like, I, that's what he is. And, and beyond that, how about the fact that he also throws 95 sits 95 has run it up to 99. And the Marlins feel like there's more in there. Like, they, they think that he can gain another tick or two. They, they wouldn't be surprised if he's sitting 97. So if he's sitting 97, he's he, he could be in the conversation for top pitching prospect in baseball by that time. Yeah. Like, I don't know who else will be there. Like, there'll be other names, of course, but like, for sure. It has above average carry already. And I love that you mentioned that the combination of the fastball and changeup from that release, because it's long and he hides the ball. Right. You can't pick up the difference. So those two pitches alone give him a great floor. And then the fact that the slider's already – or the breaking ball's already above average, I think it can turn into a plus pitch. If, if that does too, you got three plus pitches, at least average command. I think the command could continue to progress too, and, and that could change that grade too. It's just hard to kind of project that for a 6'5 lefty, yeah. like what the command's going to be. But if it's even average, that's a number two type of starter right there. I, I also just like watching changeups dance and like his dances. I'm not talking like knuckleball dance. Like I'm talking just dive, like have that kind of fade, have that real, it feels like manipulated fade to it. And Thomas yep. White's changeup actually moves as opposed to just being that drifter off the fastball that can be fine. But like, I prefer if you actually have something to it and the Marlins are really good at finding guys that do that or nurturing that within guys if they don't have it. Um, and it seems like he already has it and he's in the organization to make it better. And what I love is you're, you're getting a 29% strikeout rate, but he also picks up above average ground ball rate because of those two secondaries and and even the fastball. Like he's not afraid to put it at the bottom and at the top. And what's yeah? What's the ground ball rate on the changeup? 57%. Yeah, there you go. Like yeah, I was no expecting it to be in the 60 that. range. Yeah. No, no one's barely. It, the changeup might be better than a 60. Like I, yeah. I, I have, I'll have to see it more. Like this was, you know, just what we've seen so far and he isn't throwing it more than, you know, usually I want to see a pitch thrown like more than 20% of the time before I throw a 70 on it. Uh, yeah. But I mean, it's, it's a comfortable, like comfortably plus pitch. And I mean, he's, he's already tracking like a middle rotation starter. And I think the Marlins may have more than that. So that'll do it for the Marlins system. We are back on our 
team top prospect round, which I'm really excited about. Next week will either be the White Sox, the Phillies, or the Guardians. It's going to be one of those three. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But excited to get that one out as well and continue to hammer through these team top prospect lists. If you could leave a rating, help us grow the show, that would be awesome. Leave a written review uh, and subscribe to the YouTube. Check us out there as well. As always, thank you for listening. Look forward to talking prospects with you next week. Have a great weekend.